Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Lucia has since 2014, under a previous Labour government administration headed by the member for Viewfort South, Dr. Kenny Ashley, engaged in taking steps to address an important law reform referred to as the insolvency law. The proposed legislation will have a positive impact on the overall credit environment in St. Lucia. The overall objective of the insolvency law reform project is to work with businesses as well as individuals who are experiencing financial distress by giving them a chance at reorganizing all their debt so as to meet their financial obligations to their creditors. Mr. Speaker, let us take the example of a farmer whose income has decreased due to the passage of a storm. Through the proposed Office of the Supervisor of Insolvency, he will be able to renegotiate the monthly payment of his loan. Now, during that period of renegotiation, that farmer will not be bothered by any of his creditors. He would have a certain measure of breathing space during the negotiations. Mr. Speaker, though there is a lot of stigma attached to being insolvent or having an insolvent business, I reassure you that there are several advantages in adopting proper insolvency legislation, which benefits both consumers and creditors. Some of these advantages include A, a proper comprehensive and functional consumer-driven system for handling conflict between lenders and borrowers. B, a means of saving businesses which promotes the efficient growth of business enterprises in the private sector. C, it reduces the number of non-performing loans in the financial sector. D, creditors are more certain on the recovery of monies lent out, which has a positive effect on the cost of borrowing. E, a proper legal and regulatory framework which balances both the rights and interests of borrowers and lenders. F, the removal of overhanging debt from the borrower, giving them a fresh start and a chance to free their future income from past debt. Now this bill consists of many advantages to consumers and offers a level of protection for them. These advantages include, one, permits a borrower to negotiate a partial or total wipe off of his debts. Two, establishes a low cost out of court restructuring process whereby borrowers can work with their creditors to negotiate a, mutu a mutually beneficial solution. Three, gives borrowers the power to stop creditors from pursuing them. Four, permits borrowers to stop the sale of consumers' assets while they resolve their debt payments. And most importantly, now this one is the one which is very important to the Honorable Member for Castries East, Honorable Prime Minister, always says protection of the homestead, protection of the homestead. It allows for protection of the primary residence of a debtor, where a certain amount of a debtor's equity in the primary residence is exempt from creditors. This means that the primary residence can be sold to satisfy its creditors' needs. However, an amount is given to the debtor from the sale to help them start over. I direct members' attention to section 173 at page 133 of the bill under the, hide, the, he, the headline the heading property of bankrupt. I refer members to section 173, one which refers to does not comprise, the property of the bankrupt does not comprise. You have property one, property held by the bankrupt and trust for any other person. Two, Roman numeral two, any property that as against the bankrupt is exempt from execution or seizure under any laws. But I direct members' attention to the new addition, Roman numeral six, the prescribed amount to be paid out of the proceeds of sale of the principal residence. This is a new addition, it's where we're going to protect the homestead. The relevant amount that would be applicable will be determined after discussion with the relevant parties, being the Office of the Supervisor of Insolvency, the debtors, and the creditors. Like the law in other jurisdictions and, other, and other, other countries, a certain amount of the debtor's equity in the principal residence is exempt from the creditors. As such, the principal residence can be sold to satisfy creditors, but an amount is given to the debtor from the sale of the principal residence to help start over. Of course, the amount to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the, property, the value of the property. For example, you may say, based on the particular property, you may need $50,000 to start your life over, then, based on the, the discussion, you'll get $50,000. Now, the, for the avoidance of doubt, 
This bill is not geared towards taking poor people's homes. It's a bill to assist um, persons. Now, the bill also allows for an additional six months, equivalent to one year, for debtors with terminal medical conditions to put forward or file their proposal, another important measure for the member of Castries East, in order to benefit from the stay of proceedings granted under the bill. Based on advice from a certified medical practitioner, terminal illness is a disease that cannot be cured or adequately treated and is expected to result in death. Some examples of terminal illness are diseases such as cancer or advanced heart disease. I direct members' attention to section 62.4, page 87, section 68.1 at page 92, section 71.1 and 2 at pages 93 and 94 of the bill, and section 73 at page 95. At that section, the prescribed form and the prescribed medical conditions will be outlined in the regulations. At the moment, the laws of St. Lucia offer no debtor protection. If you owe money to your creditors, then your home can be taken, sold, and the proceeds used to pay off creditors. Of course, it's a long-established concept of a free market that if you incur debt, your property is liable for the repayment. It is the basis upon which credit is given. The task of the government is to balance the rights of the creditors, especially secured creditors, to recover their debts and give debtors the ability to save themselves and their property. <laughs> the UN model law on insolvency, which is the basis of this insolvency bill, attempts to balance these, com these two competing interests without denying rights that have underpinned the credit market. Proposals. Proposals are the methods by which the insolvency bill gives a debtor the power to save themselves and their property. At present, a debtor has no way to stop a creditor for collecting on its debts. However, upon the filing of a proposal or a notice of intention to file a proposal, debtors can stop all creditors from enforcing their rights of collection. This power to stop creditors in their tracks does not exist anywhere but in this new insolvency bill. Now, there are two types of proposals. You have a general proposal and a consumer proposal. A general proposal is for co companies and all individuals. A consumer proposal is for individuals only with smaller debts. I direct members' attention to the definition of a consumer debtor at page 42 of the bill. A consumer debtor means an individual who is a bankrupt or an insolvent person, a whose aggregate debts, excluding debts secured by the principal residence of the individual, are not more than $250,000 or other prescribed amount. The second part B, which we put in to protect the homestead, is whose debt is secured by the principal residence of the individual, where the total cost of the individual to acquire the principal residence does not exceed the prescribed amount. The prescribed amount would be placed in the regulations to be, um, to be drafted. We're looking at maybe a figure of about $400,000 if, if that is acceptable. So both types of proposals follow the same path. First, a debtor files a notice of intention or a proposal. This leads to an automatic stay of all proceedings against a debtor. No creditors can enforce their right of collection. The debtor is given time to work out the terms of their proposal without interference from creditors and with the assistance of a trained professional being that of the trustee. A successful proposal is one that is accepted by the trustee, creditors, and the court or the supervisor. A successful proposal becomes the next terms of the debtor's obligations to creditors and all matters of debt collection are at an end. Mr. Speaker, the key difference between a general proposal and a consumer proposal is what happens when a proposal fails. If a general proposal does not exceed, the debtor is declared bankrupt. The property is taken and the debts and the debts paid. If a consumer proposal does not succeed, then nothing happens to the individual. They do not go bankrupt and they do not lose their property. They do lose protection and creditors can enforce their collection rights. However, after six months, they can restart the process of a consumer proposal again. Six months, you go six months, Nothing happens, you go six months. So that is the protection for a consumer debtor, small man, in this context of this new insolvency bill. Now, the ability, Mr. Speaker, for debtors to stop collection proceedings and negotiate new terms on debt repayment, including debt reduction or cancellation, 
is this power the insolvency bill gives debtors that they never had before. It attempts to balance the playing field. Starting over, the insolvency bill also provides for a new start. A bankruptcy, be it for a company or individual, means the cancellation of nearly all debts. There are ex exceptions like child support payments and starting over again debt free. When this happens, the government wants to make sure that individuals have enough to get them started again. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Finance, more specifically the National Competitive Competitiveness and Productivity Council, has placed a considerable amount of time, effort, and resources towards the development of this key piece of legislation. Some of the previous work done on this project include, one, signing of a technical advisory agreement between the World Bank and the government of St. Lucia to provide technical advice required to roll out this project. Two, completion of diagnostic exercise and, ensuing, and the ensuing report. Three, establishment of a steering committee by cabinet to provide policy direction and participate in technical discussion. discussions. This committee comprised of all key stakeholders who would be affected by the passing of this new legislation. Mr. Speaker, we've also had presentations to the St. Lucia Bar Association, the Bankers Association, the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce and Consumer Affairs Agencies. News releases on the project, transitional amendment exercise to ensure that the proposed bill is not in conflict with existing law. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the importance of the legislation to the entire citizenry of St. Lucia, and so the government through the NCPC will continue public awareness on this project. And in our midst, we have some members, Ms. Flora and her team. I would like to thank them for their continued work. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that the entire citizens of St. Lucia understand how they can use this legislation to help them get rid of burdensome debts with little cost to them. In the coming weeks and months, the NCPC plans to continue having public service announcements, advertisements, presentations, training exercises, etc., both in the English and Creole language. This is to ensure that we provide the continued knowledge on how this new system will function and the advantages to all parties involved. Mr. Speaker, we are therefore allowing widespread awareness and education. As such, we encourage everyone to pay attention and participate as much as possible in these various awareness activities organized by the NCPC. Of course, this feedback and contribution of the entire populace is critical. When this piece of legislation comes into force, we're encouraging, Mr. Speaker, debtors to engage with, other, with their creditors. Do not run away or ignore them the insolvency bill is there to help you and to assist you going forward, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I present the insolvency bill for deliberation by this Honorable House. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.